Uh, welcome, and thanks for joining us today for our 25th episode of the Restaurant Dealmaker Show, where we discuss pertinent issues regarding the food and beverage industry with industry professionals. Uh, my guest co-host today is John Sangmeister, who I had the pleasure of knowing since 2015 when I contacted him regarding purchasing Fisherman's Grotto No. 9 in San Francisco, which I sold that year, however, unfortunately, not to John. John is an entrepreneur and a passionate sailor. Um, he previously served as director of restaurant development of Panda Restaurant Group, responsible for surveying new sites and negotiating lease terms for more than 60 locations in seven Western states. For seven years, John served on the Downtown Long Beach Associates Board of Directors, the final two as chairman. Before that, John was an investment representative with Alex Brown and Sons, where he developed and delivered several investment banking clients that raised over $150 million in capital. John's passion for sailing began as a young age, and he was influenced by his father, who was a sailor. And since then, John has developed a reputation of being one of the top sailors in world competition. John has participated in many Transpac races, uh, which is the sailing race between California and Hawaii, and John was a lead team member with Dennis O'Connor, Dennis O'Connor, uh, that won the Transpac. And John headed the only boat in the history of the Transpac that actually sunk, which I'm sure John will have a few comments on. Uh, John's wife Sarah, who is the managing partner of a prestigious law firm, met John sailing, and Sarah has participated herself in three Transpac races um, on her own. John and his family, including three sons were instrumental in bringing the 2008 Olympic sailing venue to Long Beach, the future, I should say, Olympic sailing venue to Long Beach. And in 2012, John served on the San Francisco America's Cup Organizing Committee. I could spend the entire hour uh, discussing John's prominent sailing history, but it is time to discuss John's career as a prominent restaurateur, having been involved as the owner of the famous Gladstone's Long Beach since 2000. Four. So before I begin my discussion with John, uh, if you have any questions during the show, please type them in the question bar and we'll get back to you during the show. And if not, we'll try to get back to you after the show. So with all that being said, John, uh, welcome. Nice to have you. And as a start, uh, I was curious to know, how did you get started in the food and beverage business? And, and what was your first job in the industry? Well, Steve, thank you for having me. Uh, this afternoon and it's a great it's a great uh, privilege and pleasure to be here I appreciate your kindness and uh, uh, I started off in the restaurant business as a dishwasher but uh, I thought I was going to be a waiter I had a summer job lined up in uh, Nantucket Massachusetts and I arrived uh, in my summer break from high school and thinking that great I'm off and they said no we have no jobs and uh we don't need any waiters. And I said, well, you need a painter. And they said, yes, we do need a painter. <laughs> so I, I was a painter for a couple of weeks and then I was a, a dishwasher. Then I was a, a bus boy and eventually I was a waiter. And, uh, you know, I love the, the experience. I call casual dining, full service restaurant performance art. And uh, I love being there. You know, the stage is set. The guests arrive as part of the uh, the ensemble, and uh, the play begins. Got it. You know, it's really interesting that you brought the painting thing up because, in my uh, years, uh, when I started as a dishwasher as well in a family business at fifteen, and then uh, I was working uh, sort of cooking through high school part time, you know, on weekends and uh, some part of the summer. But I also had a, a job working, uh, we had these buffet restaurants, a chain of four buffet restaurants. And I remember very succinctly uh, when I was 17 or 18, I was charged with painting the back of the house of, a, of, of one of the restaurants. So there's yeah. a correlation there. And interesting enough, my father was in the paint business before he got into the restaurant business, but that's a whole story by itself. We won't rest our time on that. So, so what's your favorite part of the hospitality business? Well, you know, the best part about the restaurant business is uh, the people and the worst part about the restaurant business is the people. Um, yeah. You know, I, I'm really fortunate. I've, I've been working with the same team, uh, a good percentage of them since we opened. 
We have, uh, I call them uh, OGs, original Gladstones. Um, Scott Hewitt, our operating partner, has been with us since before we opened. We Half of our kitchen staff is, oh, probably, I, I know I have six from, from day one still. And it's fun to grow as a family with this group. We're getting set to uh, begin construction for our new location in San Diego at uh, Seaport Village. And I'm excited because, you know, Dick Schneider, who founded uh, In-N-Out Burger, when asked why he opened his second restaurant, he said, well, I need to create an economic opportunity for my top people. And really, that's my goal for the next 10 years is to grow the Gladstones brand and create economic opportunities for my team. Very nice. Very nice. Yeah, it's all about the people. There's no question about that. That's what makes the the world tick. And yep. especially the restaurant business. It's such a, such a team event, for sure. Um, you, you have a, a tremendous, needless to say, sailing career. And, and, and how has that career been beneficial to your career as a successful restaurateur? I was fortunate to sail with Dennis Garner in the 87 and 92 America's Cups. I've sailed in nine and a half transpack races. Half, half was one where we didn't quite make it to Hawaii and the, the boat broke in the middle of the night and uh, she sank underneath us. And our dear friends, Roy Disney on the Piwaka crew sailed up to us and, and brought us home. You know, I, I've um, participated in a series of what I call poor man Richard Branson stunts. We use sailing as a promotional tool for, for our brand. It's also, it's, it's surely a family passion of ours, but our boats sail as branded entities. They go as Team Gladstones. And we've, we've generated enough interest either through victories or mishaps to uh, help support promoting the restaurant as well. Hmm. That's interesting. Um, so what, what event or events have been the most challenging in both your restaurant? Uh, I'll start with the restaurant career first. And, and how have you dealt with those challenges? You know, I thought that I was going to tell my grandkids that, uh, that I survived the 2008, 2009 great recession. And then COVID said, hold my beer. Um, I remember in 2008, 2009, as the, fin the financial, uh, struggles started to be grow globally i was uh bussing tables at the bar and i heard two longshoremen talking about runs on swiss banks and that's where it really hit me that wow this really this this fear this contagion is going to spread globally and it was a very difficult time um it was a difficult time for a lot of our partners uh we managed to get through it and uh and grow um i think it was the, in the, the days and week, weeks leading up to the full closure in, in March, as we were being warned of this oncoming cloud of death that was approaching, you know, I was in the restaurant a lot. I, I, Andrew and Peggy Turner always urged me to, when things are difficult or during holidays, be with your team, be in the store. And I was in the store all the time and people were just breaking into sobbing fits as everyone was scared. It was, it was, a, it was palpable. I tried to keep everyone calm. Um, and those were difficult days. We were closed for 300 days in uh, 2020. Wow. And, and we, we reopened in fits and starts and we had further setbacks with additional closures and on May 31st, Long Beach was, was hit by riots that destroyed 175 businesses in three hours. Our restaurant was ground zero for those events. And it took us a long time to get back on our feet from that. Yeah, wow. Well, hopefully that will be the most terrific experience that you will have in your restaurant career for sure. So switching to your sailing career for a minute, uh, what, what event or, or events have been most challenging in your sailing career? And how did you deal with those challenges? Well, we were racing in the start of the uh, 2019 Transpac, and we were 36 hours into the race. And I'm happy to report that we were 13 miles ahead of our, our arch rival and, and worthy competitor, Pilak, at Roy Disney's boat. And it was uh, 2 in the morning, as these events always happen at 2 in the morning. 
and I was on deck and I uh, heard the loudest bang I've ever heard on a boat. And the helmsman said, I've lost steering. And we were worried that we were going to have a crash jibe and lose the mast. And we managed to control the boat. And as we went forward to take sails down, I saw water rushing into the boat. And I knew immediately that we were going to sink. That We, we could not keep up with the water ingress. And so we just made preparations. And 26 minutes later, we were off the boat and floating in a raft watching the boat sink. Wow. That must have been uh, tremendous. How did you deal with that psychologically? You know, gallows humor was a wonderful thing at the time. I was watching the boat sink, and uh, and we had our two rafts, and and my nine crew, the nine of us were in two rafts tied together. And I screamed out a, an expletive. You know, my Rolex is in the chart table, and um, it wasn't just any watch. It was the watch that Roland Pouton gave us when we won the '87 America's Cup, and he handed one out to each crew member. So it was a, it was a special memento. And as I'm being dragged aboard Piwak and just in just the most ignominious fashion ever and just feeling low, uh, our navigator came up to me and he said, looking for this? All right, there we go. Hmm. And he had the presence of mind as the radios were fizzing out, short circuiting, and the water was up to his chest. He opened up the uh, chart table underneath him and the lights were still on. They hadn't shorted out completely. And he saw a shiny thing under the water and he said, that's John's watch. And he grabbed it. And uh, I'm forever grateful for Brendan Bush's uh, presence of mind to look. He grabbed several phones and wallets that crew had left in there. And he really he saved the day for a lot of us that day. Wow. That was something else. You know, in an earlier uh, discussion we had prior to the show, uh, you mentioned that, you know, part of your philosophy is based on, you know, three key ingredients. Uh, one is attitude, one is energy, and one is integrity. And could you discuss those with uh, with us and, and, and how those play a vital role in, in your whole approach to life? Well, I, I lifted that from my, my boss, Dennis Connor. Uh, my former boss and, and now mentor, uh, he said that he could teach anyone to sail. But when he was looking for new crew, he looked for three qualities, attitude, attitude, and attitude. And I modified that for the restaurant industry. And I said, well, we need the attitude. We need the energy because it's a physical and it's a demanding job. And we need the integrity. We need the, the you know, there are a lot of things that, that just re require personal integrity. And as you and I were discussing, this is sort of a, a synopsis of the scout law and oath. And uh, we tried to keep it simple. I, you know, my, my dear friend, Sandy Saxton, who was the S and TS restaurants, you know, they, did, they had a mission statement, have fun, uh, work hard, have fun with Aloha and uh, or work hard, make money with Aloha. And so attitude energy and integrity is is our mission statement and and how we treat each other i think those are prolific yeah I, and i agree with them for sure absolutely um so what are your strongest areas of expertise and and how do you use those strengths to overcome the many challenges of of the day-to-day -day, you know business uh i don't know if it was a, a uh, an initial quality, but it's been beaten into me by uh, world events. I have a certain high threshold of resilience right now. And, you know, Howard Schultz writes in Pour Your Heart Into It. He tells the story of the early days at Starbucks. They were successful in the Pacific Northwest. I think they had 100 stores, but they made the great leap to to grow in Chicago. And they opened five or eight stores simultaneously to sort of reach market saturation. And no one knew what a Starbucks was. And he says that at the time, it, it, it nearly bankrupted his company. And uh, the senior management team uh, met and they flew to Chicago and they made the decision that they were just going to will it to succeed. And... For me, that resilience, I, I, I've spent some time with Mr. Schultz, and I've tried to indoctrinate our team into that. When, when things are difficult, we're just going to will this to happen. 
And by and large, I'd say that's that's been a, a common core value of our team. I think the other thing that we've learned, we've made a lot of mistakes along the way. And I think that we have a, uh, a self-discipline to try not to repeat mistakes and to have an attitude that we can always improve. So we're always trying to do a little bit better. Sometimes we fail. It's often uh, you can equate it to, say, shooting free throws. You don't hit every one, but you sincerely try. No, I agree with that very much. I, I, I think that I have learned so much from the mistakes I have made in my life. I'm almost grateful that I made those mistakes because it gives me uh, a, a clear direction of what I think I should be doing, uh, you know, the right way of things that to be done based upon the mistakes I've had made in the past. And so I, I think, you know, the most successful people in life, you know, you look at Edison, I mean, how many thousands of, you know, inventions he went through before he invented the light bulb and, you know, how many people went bankrupt before they became very successful. So I think, you know, it's it's helpful, I think, to have mistakes, but hopefully you have them in the, in the in the earlier part of your life, so you can you know learn from those mistakes and move forward and have more positive things happen in the second part of your life. Uh, at least that's how I look at it. So I think you know having having had mishaps is is a benefit uh, because you learn from those and hopefully will keep you on the right track in the future. So very much agree with you there. Um, so what. The hospitality industry is changing, particularly in California, you know, because of the, you know, current economic challenges we face, the shortage of employees, you know, minimum, minimum uh, uh, labor costs for fast food restaurants with 30 more chains going up to 20 bucks an hour in April, you know, all the high. Everyone's going to become a baker. It's what? Everyone is going to become a baker. <laughs> a baker. Okay. That's interesting. All right. That's a cool thing. And, and I mean, just, you know, the insurance, I mean, it's just, it's unbelievable. You know, uh, liability, uh, I, I talk to these bar guys, there's a guy at some bar operators that are paying like five, $6,000 a month for liquor liability insurance. Um, and, and occupancy costs, you know, landlords are generally greedy, you know, by and large. And so how are you dealing with, with, with all these, you know, dealing with all these, these challenges, these added challenges and in, in your operation? Well, it is challenging, and I I know many friends who have closed permanently, and it's it's heartbreaking to watch that. You know, there are family run operations that have been there 10, 20, 30 years. I I, I listened to the story of Christy Vega last week at Casa Vega, and that, that you know Casa Vega has been there for fifty six years, and their insurance was was uh, canceled because of you know vagrants destroying the perimeter of their restaurant on a on a regular basis so california is extremely challenging and frustrating too because i remember a time when it wasn't like this and i don't understand why we're not all standing at the window like uh, alex uh God, what was alex's last name uh and network saying we're mad as hell and can't and not going to take it anymore i mean i my hometown has become somewhat lawless in Long Beach and it's it's heartbreaking to watch my wife grew up in Long Beach um, and we've had significant criminal behavior in our, in our city and even as close to our our residents we had two murders within two weeks within two blocks oh my god in Belmont Shore within a quarter of a mile of George Gascon's home wow and just like and it's. I I I remember in 1993, my college roommate's brother was murdered in the shore, and Bill Shadden was a beautiful man, a beautiful young man. It was the first murder that had happened in in Belmont Shore in 20 years, and the whole community came out in a vigil, and sadly, you know, the, the events of three weeks ago. We just opened the you know, the, the operators where the events occurred, they opened up for business the next day. And I was like, wow, the way, how, how have we come to this point? How did we come to accept this as, the, as a normal? So I'm hoping things will change. There's a big election in LA County that I hope we change 
our direction in, in uh, criminal justice, but I don't know. Yeah, wow. Uh, well, I think one of the, you know, uh, positive things is that, you know, people, you know, like to eat out, you know, it's a form of obviously satisfying their hunger, basic human need, as well as they, it's, a, it's sort of an inner form of entertainment. Uh, so I think there will be continued demand, but uh, trying to maintain price value is very challenging. Um, I mean, it's just astounding, you know, to go out and eat at a, at a, at a full service restaurant, what it costs. Um, um, but I guess it's just all relative, you know, inflation, you know, is, is affecting us in every aspect of life. Um, but uh, it, again, it's very difficult to maintain price value. And so I think what's happening, I, I see it in reviewing financial statements daily, doing valuations is that margins are just decreasing um, because you can only, in order to maintain price value, you've got to have a certain, you know, uh, uh, realistic price level relative to your customer base. So, I mean, do you, do you have those kind of challenges? I mean, how, how do you deal, deal with that in order to be competitive price-wise? Uh, because you, we have, we you serve have a high quality product and a high food, you have a high food cost because you're a seafood operation, right? We have those challenges magnified. Yes. You know, I, I, uh, when we opened, we would run a twenty five ninety five pound and a half king crab special on Friday nights. And uh, what was I your answer on that? that? Uh, 50%. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. It's a lost leader. Just get them in. I understand. Yeah. But, um, you know, we, I've seen restaurants charge $150 for a pound and a half of king crab these days. So it's shocking. I mean, I, my, my barometer is the economist always is what's the cost of a Big Mac. Uh, two sausage McMuffins with eggs at McDonald's five years ago were $2.50. And today it's $6. Okay. I mean, that's yeah. shocking. Yeah, I hear you. That, that's shocking. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's tough. I mean, uh, I assume that the regularity of people eating out has been somewhat uh, reduced just because they only have so much, you know, disposable income. Right? They got to pay their mortgages and the kids education, and everything else in life. So I, I that definitely is going to have a uh, impact in terms of, I think, regularity of frequency in, 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 in restaurants. Um, or people trading down, you know, even, even, even the price of, you know, $6, you know, compared to going out and eating a, a, in a full restaurant, it's going to cost you 60, 70, 50, 70, how much, depending how much li liquor you have, you know, uh, at least. So it's, it, it is a challenge. There's no question. So John, you, you've had, had many accomplishments in your life and throughout your career. And so what single accomplishment is most meaningful to you? I, I, I saw your, your question and I'd, and I'd have to say my family, you know, I've been married for 29 years and we have three sons and uh, they haven't grown up to be jerks. And uh, I enjoy their company. And, uh, you know, last year, my wife and I were celebrating our anniversary and we were driving to a restaurant and no, we weren't going to our restaurant. I'm not that cheap a basket. And um, I said, so what do you want to do for the next 28? And she said, um, I want to build a bunch of restaurants uh sell them to darden and um uh, travel and i said great am i in the picture and she said she laughed and said yes i've got a i i have a tremendous wife and a great partner and uh i'm very proud of her we are very proud of our sons you know we have um two eagles and a, and a third on the way and uh, i'm very happy with them yeah we are, for those, we are. For those in the audience that know what an eagle is, you talk about Eagle Scout. John is a scoutmaster, and which is very near and dear to my heart because I was an Eagle Scout and very active in Boy Scouting, and it did a tremendous amount for me in terms of building character and just understanding a lot of the basic fundamentals in life. And John is a devout, you know, scoutmaster, which is the epitome of commitment. And as he said, two of his sons have been eagles, and the third one is going to become an eagle. That's that's quite unique. That 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 sounds like that goes into some sort of record book. Three out of three. Wow, that's great. So so it's, tell me the work. About, tell me because I'm I have an affinity to scouting. Tell me a little bit. How do you get? How did you get involved in scouting? Was My wife got us involved in scouting uh, when the boys were were in uh, second grade. 
Mm-hmm. And she explained it to me. She said, this is an opportunity for them to work hard and distinguish themselves as individually as individuals where they might not have that opportunity either academically or athletically. And she was a hiring partner at her former law firm. And she always put Eagle Scouts at the top of the resume list yes. because she felt that they had uh, greater success uh, post hire uh, in the firm. It just, they seem to, those, those human qualities of leadership and ethics that scouting and service that scouting teaches to scouts, um, that carried through to the work environment and it was a very positive experience. And they, they always had good luck hiring Eagles. So I said, great, I'm all in. We had, my predecessor was an Eagle scout and was with our troop for four years. And his son uh, aged out and eagled out. And it was right in the middle of, of the pandemic. And scouting was, was uh, it was pretty grim during those days. And uh, we had a parents meeting and who's going to replace me. And uh, I was the last man standing. And I'm, I feel really grateful. I asked my wife, I said, is it okay? She said, sure. And this has been the best job I've ever had. Wow. So, so how long have you been a scoutmaster and how much time commitment does that require? Uh, three and a half years. And, oh, I don't know. It's probably 10 hours a week. Wow. That's a commitment. You know, the weekends, we do we do an outing, uh, an overnight outing once a month and a day outing uh, once a month as well. Wow. So, I don't know. It, it, time flies, though. It's great fun. Wow. That's wonderful. So talking about leadership, what are the qualities of a good leader that you regularly practice? Well, I, I, I tell people that you have to earn leadership. So, I, and you have to earn loyalty. Um, I like to, I, I had the privilege of sailing with Doug DeVos on his boat, WindQuest. And Doug is the chairman of Amway. And Doug is the first to help fold sales at the end of the day. Um, he was always up front. He was uh, modest in his role on the boat, but he never missed an opportunity to do uh, the tough job. And uh, I try to set that example at, at our restaurant. And I've, I'm fortunate to work with people that emulate those, those values. Dave Thomas, when he, uh, said, what does he look for when uh, he's hiring? He said he hires MBAs, people with mop bucket attitudes. <laughs> and, you know, when we're busy on a, on a, on a Mother's Day and our, and our team is on fire and they're just, if we have an issue in the bathroom, I grab the mop. Sure. That's, that's, that's my job. Yep. So I was trained. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. I hear you. So since post COVID there've been additional challenges and how you dealt with those challenges. Uh... Are you still there? Yeah, I'm still there. I mean, maybe I didn't complete my question. Oh, well, just uh, the, the, the environment of post COVID. I mean, is it, do you find that you, there's just many more challenges for you in terms of, you know, keeping people and uh, um, you know, having the demand for outdoor seating versus indoor seating, uh, you know, just the, the whole dynamics of what the COVID has created, or, or is that sort of just obliterated because people are just used to the post COVID environment? Well, initially it was really difficult. Yes. When we finally reopened, um, for one, we were short staffed. Most, you know, probably only a third of our normal crew decided to come back to work. And then we had people that actually wanted to come into the restaurant and we had limitations on seating and, and, and how we could treat the guest and how we interacted. And you'd have to take your mask down to take a bite and put your mask back up and all of those. And, and some guests were uh, naturally inclined to do that and others were defiant. And the guest that was naturally uh, inclined would start to raise a ruckus about those who weren't and we'd have feuds within the dining room outdoor dining was our savior 
we have a, a beautiful venue uh, on the uh, Rainbow Harbor, and our patio was allowed to expand. Long Beach was pretty aggressive about allowing uh, the restaurants to expand their outdoor dining experience, um, and that really helped us. As we design our new restaurant in San Diego, you know, all of our all of the, the glazing in the restaurant, and I think there's close to 130 linear feet of waterfront frontage of glass, all of that will be uh, functional uh, windows, bifold doors that will open uh, vertically and create an awning structure as well. And so we'll have an indoor outdoor feel all the way to the kitchen. I mean, the kitchen will be enclosed, but the bar will be one breezeway, if you will. Wow, that sounds like a very challenging project. So, so with all the tremendous seafood restaurants that are you know proliferate uh, the San Diego area, how is Gladstone's going to differentiate itself and be the cutting edge, you know, seafood operator in that market? That's a good question. I hadn't thought of that. I mean, yeah, I didn't give you that question good. beforehand. I just <laughs> thought about. I mean, there 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 are some <laughs> great guys down there. You've got Fish Market. You've got. Uh, uh, Blue Water Grill, uh, there are great operators. The, the great news about San Diego is it's such a, a, a growing and, and uh, th thriving mar market. You know, the Brigantine, the Mortons are doing a great job with the Brig. Um, San Diego has built nine waterfront hotels in the last 10 years. Mm. You know, the addition of Petco Park, the, the whole gas lamp area is you know it's had some fits and starts they, they certainly they overbuilt with the condos for a while they think they built ten thousand condos and they had a little recession certainly they had a bigger recession in 08 but if you go down there today along the waterfront at least there are thousands walking along the waterfront every day and our location is well it's the old edgewater grill and we are on the water's edge with the promenade in front of us. And if you sit there for an hour, I bet uh, 2,000 people will walk by at lunch. So, you know, we're in the retail business. We're not hunting. We're fishing, no pun intended. And hopefully we have a uh, competitive fare and a nice view and a good value that people will stop in and say, let's, let's have lunch here. Let's have dinner here. Yeah, well, I'm sure you'll be very successful there. You, you're going to be using the 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 your Glad Gladstone's name, right? Obviously, yes. This is Gladstone San Diego. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I'm sure you'll get a big warm response there. And wish you lots of good luck there. Hope you're very successful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So, how, technology has definitely had an impact on the hospitality industry. And what technology have you adopted in your business, and how has it impacted operations? So our servers carry wireless handheld uh, ordering devices and, and checkout devices. Mm -hmm. That speeds things up dramatically. And I think that, you know, it, we want to maintain that high touch experience at Gladstone San Diego. Um, we're not going to ask you to go to the bar and order and then take a number and go sit at a table that's open. That That is not the experience we want to uh, uh, bring forward anything we can do to improve the guest experience and the quality we're exploring. We're looking at rational ovens. We're looking at all of the different latest technologies in, in uh, food preparation. And we want to make certain that our guest is not left hanging. You know, the, the folks at uh, uh, TS, they use the up and go. So you can scan, if your server is, is busy, you can scan the QSR code and pay for your bill on your phone. All of those things we will incorporate uh, into Gladstone San Diego. Yeah, cool. I, I see that we've got a couple of questions. Um, uh, good to see you, John. Uh, just checking in for a while. This is from Dennis Clark. Is this one of your associates? Oh, hi, Dennis. Dear friend who's living in Ohio right now. Ah, yeah. 
he also says, how did I get so lucky to meet you in the Palisades in the late 90s and, and keeping in touch with you the last 25 years? Great to have heard a little more about your story. Thank you. So it's not really a question, I guess, an acknowledgement. So it sounds like one of your devoted friends. Um, I pay. I paid him. I, you you paid him? The, checks, the check <laughs> is in the mail. That, that's great. Um, so... And as we discussed, it's a very challenging period, you know, where food and beverage operators are in some cases are having to reduce operating hours and days of operation due to the shortage of employees. So what do you see as the solutions to correct this this issue? How, in, California, how we... We need, in California, we need to have a shift back to the center. You know, I, I think that we've seen... Um, destructive progressive policies that while may have had good intentions are destroying economic opportunity and 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 actually penalizing those they mean meant to help the most you know the inflationary effects of wage hikes and other uh, legislation is outpacing uh, the cost of living is outpacing all of these wage hikes and all of their all of their best intentions are exacerbating these issues. Um, I think we need to get back to a more reasonable discussion about the relationship between an employer and employee. Um, I, I cringe when I hear politicians discuss wage theft. I, I really, I, I really, it's offensive. When you think about all this, the practices we work to make our environment, the most welcoming them and the best restaurant job uh, in Long Beach in Southern California. So I think if we can get back to a less adversarial relationship and discuss how we can grow the pie and grow the economic opportunity for all involved, that would be helpful. Well said, very well said. Um, so anyway, um, that's the end of my questions. Uh, is, are there any concluding remarks you'd like to make? Well, Steve, I'm, I'm just profoundly grateful for your friendship over the years. And I remember when you gave me your, your, your book on deal making, and I've read it and, uh, it's been uh, provided great insight for me. Um, it's great. It's a wanna... great. It's a great incentive to go to sleep too, right? <laughs> if you have a hard time sleeping at night, that's. <laughs> anyway, you know, John, I, I, go ahead. I'm sorry, I was going to offer to any budding entrepreneur: get started now. Jump into the deep end of the pool. You'd be surprised how few are in there, and uh, and you'll make mistakes, and and uh, you'll have some setbacks. But I think the personal freedom that you're given from working that in as an entrepreneur and you know i, I, I there's the old joke about i, I wanted to work because I, I only wanted to work half days which 12 hours a day did you want to work <laughs> um I, I i've it hasn't always been easy in fact it's never been easy but it's been wonderfully rewarding and uh you know i i think of the I'm very proud of a statistic I, I once wrote. I think we've generated nearly $60 million in compensation for our employees over the last 20 years. And I'm, I'm really proud of that. I don't I'm really, you. really proud of that. That's very nice. So um, I wish anyone who's going down this path, path the best of luck and uh, keep your spirits up and remain resilient well said john i want to acknowledge you uh for the leadership uh contributions you have made to the sailing world and to the restaurant industry and the commitments you have made to this world as a, as a scoutmaster, an active lay leader in the city of long beach and the many other worthwhile organizations you have been involved with throughout your years and i want to thank you very much for this informative discussion today um, if people want to get in touch with you, John, what is the best way to do that? John, J-O-H-N, at Gladstones, with an S, longbeach.com. Okay. I, I certainly won't forget that email address. 
Uh, I'd like to mention our uh, future dealmaker shows coming up. Uh, April 24th, we have Steve Mayer, who's the managing partner of SD Mayer and Associates, which is one of the largest hospitality accounting and consulting practices in the area. And he actually serves as, uh, as interim CEOs of various restaurant companies that are in trouble or there are disputes among uh, owners, whatever. And I've had the pleasure of working with Steve and, and some workouts and those kind of situations. Uh, in May, uh, Heidi Kraling, uh, who's a chef owner of the famous award-winning Ensalada Mediterranean restaurant in San Anselmo, uh, and she's been in business for nearly 30 years, and she spends a lot of time doing good things for society, just like John has. Uh, she makes a lot of contributions to some really worthwhile nonprofit organizations. June 27th, uh, Donna Solomon, uh, who's a former client, actually sold her the restaurant, and then she converted it into Cucina, which in, is in San Anselmo. It's one of the top Italian restaurants, uh, uh, and uh, she's a very uh, progressive, uh, successful operator. has a lot of passion for what she does. July 25th, we have a gentleman. His name is Ike Shaheda. Uh, he's the founder of Ike Sandwiches, very interesting uh, fellow, wow. very young. Uh, he has over 100 restaurants, uh, in yep. most of them in California, but he has also restaurants in Arizona, Colorado, Nevada, Texas, and Utah. And in April, in August, uh, we have Vivian Borges. Uh, she is a client. We just sold her business, uh, which is Paris Bakery in Monterey. And they also have a wholesale, wholesale operation in Seaside. She's a very strong uh, lady that uh, French lady that made this operation with her family very successful and decided at this point in their life they wanted to do other things so we wish her well so that's our upcoming lineup uh, we want to thank you all for joining us today and if you want to get in touch with me I can be reached at Steve at restaurantrealty.com or I can be reached at 888-995-9701 so, John, again, thank you very much. Enjoyed your comments uh, and your sincerity and, and your your whole demeanor. I mean, you're 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 just a lovely person. What can I say? Uh, thank you. Fight on. <laughs> so, anyway, everyone, take care of yourself, take care of others, and stay well. And thanks for joining us today. Thank you, John. Thank you all. Take care.